By now it should be seen as no secret that space is actually chock full of demons. Well, at least that's how it is in Warhammer 40k. The verdict is still out there on whether or not that's true in real life. And out of all of the terrifying demonic entities that prowl the realm of chaos and frequently blight our universe with the sin of their existence, four stand apart from the rest as beings of apocalyptic might, malevolent entities that are so dangerous their existence has to be kept a closely guarded secret by the holy ordos of the Inquisition. Now, I speak, of course, of greater demons, like the bloodthirsters of corn, who are the avatars of hatred, existing only to spill blood and take skulls. The keepers of secrets, the embodiment of seductive excess, repugnant creatures that delight in inflicting untold agony on mortals. There's the great unclean ones, the avatars of rot and entropy, a massive bloated monstrosities teeming with every disease, virus, and parasite known to man. And finally, there's the Lords of Change, masters of sorcery in all its forms, and duplicitous agents of change whose mere presence can fracture minds and send mortals reeling into the oblivion of insanity. But what are the greater demons all about? What is their purpose and what role do they fill within the hierarchy of chaos? And potentially most importantly, which one of these dudes is the strongest? Well, today we're gonna to be getting into that and a whole lot more. But first a quick shout out to this video's sponsor and then we're gonna dive headfirst into the grimdark. If you somehow haven't heard of it, Tacticus is the definitive tactile mobile game for Warhammer 40,000 fans that allows you to get your Warhammer fix anytime, anywhere. In fast-paced PvE campaigns, tightly competitive PvP battles, and also massively collaborative boss fights under your guild banner. It's hard to believe it's already been a year since Tacticus first became available, and it's impressive to see just how much the game has changed since launch. Snowprint Studios has launched tons of fresh and exciting content, including new features, game modes, challenging events, and at this point, over 50 champions and 13 playable factions. I asked the devs what they believed was the number one reason Tacticus has been such a lasting success, and they told me it was due to the constant support and feedback of their passionate community, and to thank them, they're planning a huge anniversary celebration for the players. In this event, the new Tyranid threat has emerged and the Space Marines must answer the call to combat the Endless Swarm. Muster your champions and join Tacticus for a week of challenging battles, exciting rewards, and not to mention tons of loot. The special anniversary event starts on August 13th and runs until August 19th. It's the perfect time for all Warhammer 40,000 fans to enter the tactical battlefields of the Grimdark. There's going to be week-long exclusive calendar offers and a mighty fight against Tyranids during special recurring events. There's never been a better time to start playing Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus, and you can do so for free by downloading it from the App Store, Google Play, or the Samsung Galaxy Store. Click on the link in the description of this video to start playing for free today. Big thanks to Warhammer Tacticus for sponsoring this video. Among the teeming masses of demonic entities that prowl the realm of chaos, none are as feared as those the faithful refer to as greater demons. These are demonic entities of supreme ability, each a reflection of their patron god and an unholy master of corruption. They are the generals and lieutenants of chaos, the supreme commanders of its demonic legions, and the will of the chaos god's given form. Although their manifestations are thankfully rare, when they do deign to blight the physical universe with their presence, rampant destruction and untold levels of corruption are always left in their blazing wakes. They are some of the most powerful combatants ever documented and come in four distinct forms, the endless rage of the bloodthirsters, who can cleave tanks in twain and rip fortresses open with a single swing of their massive axes, the towering great unclean ones, avatars of filth and disease that act as a vector for every known pathogen in the universe, the beguiling and seductive keepers of secrets that are faster than the human eye can track and delight in the suffering and anguish they inflict upon mortals, or the limitless destructive sorceries of the impossibly intelligent lords of change. These are entities that the mortal mind was not designed to comprehend. Their existence is something that we're not truly capable of processing. In fact, when we witness them in the artwork of Warhammer 40k, the form we see is our mind trying to make sense of the unexplainable, to give shape to something that is inherently shapeless. The simple act of seeing them with our mortal eyes is a subconscious defense mechanism of the human psyche. It is to generate in our mind an image that, although admittedly horrifying, is grounded within the laws of our universe. 
and thus our mind is allowed to accept its existence without fracturing under the sheer impossibility of the greater demon's truth. Like all demons, they are creatures of the warp, entities made not of flesh and bone and tangible substance, but energy and emotion. For as much as our mind wants to interpret something like a bloodthirster as a towering humanoid combatant that rampages across the battlefield, it's more accurate to think of them as literally the emotion of rage given sentience. Greater demons themselves are granted a much greater amount of freedom than the lesser demons beneath them. It's true that they are each a manifestation of the god that created them, but they all possess a will that is uniquely their own. They each have their own quirks, nuances, aspirations, and oftentimes their ambition can give way to desires that directly contradict the plans of their patron deity. Many more have even demonstrated particularly remarkable skills and abilities that their god in question may not even be capable of. Two good examples of this come in the form of two different Lords of Change, as in Karos Fateweaver, traditionally seen as the most exalted of Lords of Change, has the ability to see into the future, as something that Zinch himself has struggled with. Although I will admit that Karos doesn't see only one definitive future, but the infinite possible futures as well, as something that has caused him to go insane even by demonic standards. Thus, making sense of his ramblings is a full-time job for a whole host of other Lords of Change. There is another Lord of Change known as, and I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm going to butcher my way through this, Eteos Raukiers, who is said to be so unbelievably powerful that Zinch keeps him chained up at all times, only deploying him when absolutely necessary, as the power that he wields is something that even a Chaos God is afraid of. Although we refer to them as greater demons, as in they are more exalted than the lesser demons beneath them, this title really doesn't do justice to just how powerful these malignant entities truly are. A greater demon is so much more than simply a more powerful demon. Most of them are worshipped as gods in their own right by cults and cultures throughout time and space. The bloodthirsters have been depicted as gods of war by warrior cults across time. Some of these cultures may have viewed them as honorable patriarchs of martial prowess, and others may have seen them as insidious entities that led the cult to salvation through bloodshed. There's even been ancient depictions of bovine-faced keepers of secrets, with massively exaggerated and curvaceous physical features that have been documented in cave paintings from ancient long-dead societies, and were believed by some to have been worshipped as a form of fertility goddess. Even in the grimdark future, there are countless underground cults that have dedicated the entirety of their existence to the worship and following of a single greater demon. Although each of the four greater demons are a truly horrifying foe to face in battle, their true terror is not just in their destructive nature, but in their ability to corrupt the masses, to spread their vile messages of hatred, rot, excess, and deceit to lay low the foundations of mankind, not only through physical violence, but by twisting the hearts and minds of mortals against each other. Each and every one of them has a role to play within the great game, and only the truly ignorant and foolish would ever enter into a pact with such a malignant abomination. Now that we know a bit more about what a greater demon is, let's talk about all four of them in greater detail, and we'll start with the Bloodthirsters of Corn. Out of all the demonic servants of the Blood God, none are as exalted as the Bloodthirsters, for they are rage and slaughter given form, the unholy avatars of Korn's infinite hatred, and are by far the most straightforward of all of the demons that we're going to be talking about in this video. They exist purely for war, their only goal to drown the worlds of our galaxy in figurative and sometimes literal oceans of blood. Wherever the Blood God's Chosen go, they infect the population with a sickness of slaughter, their hatred a disease that spreads with a malevolent sentience so effective it would make Korn's brother Nurgle, the Lord of Plagues, envious. At his core, Korn is a warrior god, and none better encapsulate his essence more so than the Bloodthirsters, entities that quake the universe under the weight of their rage. They are the Blood God's emissaries, who spread his unholy message of unfettered rage, not with words, but through the divine instruments of sword, axe, and whip. Every weapon stroke, every twist of the blade, sends a reverberating message across space and time, a simple yet powerful proclamation of their purpose. Blood for the Blood God, 
skulls for the Skull Throne. The Bloodthirsters are Korn's generals and commanders, leaders of his vast horde of bloodthirsty demons, and each one is a towering monster clad in blood-drenched brass armor. They wield titanic melee weapons that have been infused with demonic hatred and hunger for the blood of mortals, many of which are capable of flight as they are also draped in enormous leathery bat wings. These bloodthirsters soar through the skies in pursuit of worthy prey, kept aloft by air currents that have been superheated by their own hatred. They are utterly relentless in the pursuit of single-minded violence, and thus are unshackled from the weaknesses of doubt, mercy, and compassion. They are some of the strongest singular melee combatants that have ever been documented within the grimdark future, and are an unstoppable force, destruction incarnate, and unflinching butchers of the weak. There is no reasoning with a bloodthirster, no chance for a parlay but at least with the other greater demons, they might be able to offer you something that you want in exchange for your corruption, cooperation, or alignment. Now, this is obviously a catch-22 and is a surefire path towards damnation, but the option at least exists. The only thing a bloodthirster can offer anyone who would foolishly stand in their way is death in the name of corn. For a bloodthirster does not see the individual. He doesn't see the merits of any given person no matter how accomplished their deeds, no matter what contribution they have made to the universe, and no matter what they could possibly offer the bloodthirster. To them, they are simply either a coward that needs to be culled or a challenger to be defeated. There are several different types of bloodthirsters, and they are organized in an eightfold hierarchy of different hosts. Unfortunately, as of the time of recording this video, we've only been given insight into four of them. That is the first host, the Exalted Bloodthirsters, of which there are only eight and are supposedly the mightiest of their kind. The third host, known as the Wrath of Corn, the sixth host, the Bloodthirsters of Insensate Rage, and the eighth host, the Bloodthirsters of Unfettered Fury. These are the bloodthirsters that most commonly wield a pair of weapons. One, the massive iconic axes of corn that are capable of carving a battle tank in half with a single swing, and in their offhand, a vicious whip that has been studded with brass spikes and arcs across the air, cracking with the sound of thunder as the terrible lash renders entire mobs into gelatinous gore. On the other hand, we have the bloodthirsters of insensate rage, who are potentially the most mindlessly savage of all of the bloodthirsters in that they are so utterly consumed within the fires of Korn's rage that they have been rendered utterly incoherent with anger. Now, all bloodthirsters are brutal, don't get it twisted, but whereas the other bloodthirsters exist as a blend of brutality and tactical expertise, the bloodthirsters of insensate rage are like a force of nature, a hurricane of violence that is utterly unpredictable and unable to be controlled. They wield massive two-handed axes as tall as a fortress gate and drive all those that follow them into a deranged kill frenzy. Finally, there are the Wrath of Corn Bloodthirsters, airborne predators that scour the battlefield in search of worthy prey. Their role on the battlefield takes the form of a giant winged assassin, an arrogant hunter that seeks to humble only the worthiest of heroes. From their vantage point in the sky, they seek out enemy warlords, generals, and champions of renown before swooping down with a single goal of butchering them in the name of the Blood God. For as terrifying as the Bloodthirsters are, the next greater demon that we're going to talk about is the fear of death shared by all sentient creatures given form. If we were to rank the greater demons in terms of which is capable of eliciting the strongest feelings of utter revulsion in mortals, the great unclean ones would certainly be at the top of the list. They are titanic amalgamations of disease-ridden, rotten flesh, mountains of rancid blubber that are clouded by swarms of demonic flies, and whose maggot-ridden innards spill forward and drag through the muck and grime of the battlefield, from tears and gashes in the demon's swollen bellies. They are each covered in clusters of weeping pustules that incubate swarms of pestilent nurglings and chattering needle-teethed imps that erupt from the Great Unclean One's sores like a tide of leprous, disease-riddled piranhas. The combination of the Great Unclean One's physical body horror and pungent, rancid stench is so potent it can drive all of those in its presence into madness. And despite their horrifying appearance, the Great Unclean Ones actually exhibit a strange duality that is unique to the denizens of Nurgle's garden. On one hand, they are single-handedly the most grotesque and disturbing entities that have ever blighted our universe. Yet, conversely, they display a deep paternal affection for all those that follow them into battle. 
They are like loving parents that view each of their demonic warriors and mortal servants alike like a proud father may view their children. They take pride in the achievements of each of them and bestow upon them ever more virulent and disgusting blessings derived from the grandfather himself. When the legions of Nurgle march to wars, the war cries of the blubberous great unclean ones are at odds with those displayed by other demonic generals. Whereas a bloodthirster of corn may shout only incoherent ramblings that are dripping with anger and bloodlust, the great unclean one in turn shouts booming words of encouragement to his children, a proclamation of he and Nurgle's eternal love. There are many great unclean ones that have even viewed the enemy as simply misguided, Individuals that, although unfortunate, they have found themselves in conflict with one another, it simply need to be shown the truth, the beauty of decay, an entropic message that the great unclean one and its herd of disgusting followers are all too happy to enforce upon the ignorant. The jovial nature of the great unclean one is simply a mask. They are malevolent creatures that seek to spread filth and disease across the known universe and they do not take kindly to their ideals of rot being rejected. To harm any of the lesser demons under his command or reject his pestilent gifts through the use of medicine and vaccines is to twist its joy and love into a fiery paternal rage. When roused to fight, the Great Unclean One is a perplexing and terrifying sight. They are unstoppable in their advance and are seemingly immune to harm as bullets and blades are shrugged off as if they were nothing more than bothersome insects. Despite the seeming impossibility of it, considering the minuscule legs that support the monstrosity, the Great Unclean One is said to be inhumanly fast. They charge into the enemy like an enormous fetid wrecking ball that leaves behind a trail of destruction and oozing filth. Like a rotund, leprous battering ram, the Great Unclean One wrecks havoc through the enemy lines as fortifications are smashed apart and infantry is sent flying in every direction. Their weaponry comes in the form of plague flails, filth-encrusted bile blades, and rusted doomsday bells, each of which is an unholy instrument of plague, dripping in virulent toxins, viruses, and bacteria that are so potent they can infect the atmosphere around them with pestilence. Whereas the Great Unclean One may not be as physically strong as its counterpart within the Legions of Corn, their ludicrous endurance allows them to weather the storm of an entire army. What's more, they're capable of breathing in deep the pestilent winds of the Garden of Nurgle to vomit forth psychic tides of filth, maggots, and mucus that inflict all those caught within its torrential downpour with a virulent cocktail of horrendous demonic diseases. The bodies of each of these stench lords acts kind of like a cauldron and is constantly in motion to make ever more terrifying plagues, each of which is brewed deep within their guts to perfect potency before finally bursting forth from their bellies to spread their virulent contents in every direction. Killing such a creature is nearly an impossible task as melee and ranged weaponry prove to be almost entirely useless against them. Blades get caught in rolls of rancid fat and weeping innards, and bolter shells detonate into clouds of pus and filth that serve only to aid the creature in its mission of spreading rot. On the rare occasion that one of them is actually brought down, the victory is almost always cut short by the sound of the demon's immense body detonating. This comes in the form of an explosion of demonic excrement, acid, contagions, and seemingly countless other demonic parasitic life forms that have been gestating within its bulk. The fear that is generated by the Great Unclean Ones comes by just how utterly repulsive and disgusting they are, but the next demon we're going to talk about on this list goes in the complete opposite direction and is equally as terrifying. Out of all of the greater demons, the Keeper of Secrets is by far the most perplexing and confusing. On one hand, they are loathsome, repugnant monstrosities that delight in the misery and suffering of others. Yet, on the other hand, they are elegant and beautiful, glamorous patrons that bestow upon the faithful every indulgence they could possibly imagine. And to witness a Keeper of Secrets is to witness the totality of beauty and revulsion in a singular reality-defying entity as everything about them exemplifies their conflicted nature. Their towering, lithe bodies are an androgynous fusion of human and animal parts, a sensual combination of additional appendages and claws, all wrapped in scintillating clothing woven from the finest of materials. Their powerful muscular form is coated in balms and scented oils, as well as jewels of impossible worth that accentuate its hypnotic movements. The mind-altering musks they generate, although difficult to describe, 
are said to smell like a combination of the world's most illustrious perfume mixed with rotting meat. To witness such a creature is to simultaneously experience fear and joy, despair and hope, revulsion and arousal, suffering and pleasure, emotions that the Keeper of Secrets delights in forcing upon mortals. To simply stand in their presence is to surrender the entirety of one's self-will. It doesn't matter how disciplined they are, it doesn't matter how much they pride themselves on their ability to resist temptation. To the Keeper of Secrets, all is laid bare. Every thought, every desire, every hope and wish that they have ever experienced exists as ammunition the creature can use to manipulate and dominate its foes by infecting their mind with whispered promises that are impossible to resist. Their ability to manipulate on a grand scale is one of the most dangerous things about them, as none are immune to their ability to deceive and corrupt, and entire sectors can fall under their influence. This isn't to say that they aren't also a terrifying force upon the battlefield, as in addition to them being the masters of manipulation, they are also vicious and graceful killers that delight in the sadistic excess of wanton violence. That being said, violence is only one part of the infinite spectrum of excess that Slanesh delights in. Thus, the Keepers of Secrets are only deployed in force when all else has failed. When the ignorant of mankind reject the pleasures of the Dark Prince, the Keepers of Secrets take to the battlefield to correct this misjudgment through great and terrible violence. Violence that will be delivered in spectacular excess. They take a sickening pleasure in all forms of slaughter and torture, and are like twisted artists that view the act of excruciatingly painful death-dealing as a form of creative expression. When unleashed upon the battlefield, their sensual and delicate forms are at odds with their horrendously strong, blinding strikes that come out of nowhere at Quicksilver's speed. They are ludicrously fast, faster perhaps than any of the other demons aligned to the ruinous powers. They tear across the battlefield, every strike so expertly delivered that it spills blood in a pleasing pattern, and spreads severed limbs across the field in the form of an exotic tapestry. They are sadistically cruel, monstrously powerful, and perhaps most terrifyingly of all, frighteningly intelligent. Every act they commit, every foe they maim, is part of the Keeper's grand orchestra of pain, a symphony of suffering accentuated by the percussion of explosions and the crescendo of the agonized screams of their victims as they are torn limb from limb. Aside from their remarkable skills as a physical combatant, they are also practitioners of the mystical arts. Their powers can be used to lead the weak to their doom turn allies against each other, or unleash terrifying psychic agony across a wide area. There is nothing more seductive to the Keepers themselves than the corruption of warriors with particularly noble hearts, individuals that believe themselves incorruptible and are set on a path of discipline and virtue. To twist the heart of such a stoic individual and turn their quest for glory into a debased lusting for excess and depravity is like an irresistible drug to the Keepers. Thus, they will routinely seek out such men and women, sacrificing them to the perverted will of Slanesh. Although it may be difficult to believe, it is said that the Keepers of Secrets and many of Slanesh's demonic forces in general enjoy battle even more than the bloodthirsty warriors of Korn. However, despite their shared appreciation for death dealing, there does exist a bitter rivalry between the two gods and their forces. Slanesh views Korn as a brute that cannot appreciate the beauty of war, a simpleton that is too consumed with the act of slaughter that they are incapable of savoring the ecstasy of it. Korn and his followers, on the other hand, despise Slanesh. The battle is all that matters, killing is a purpose in and of itself, and to draw out the victim's suffering is nothing more than a roadblock to spilling more blood and taking more skulls. To us mortals, the act of wanton slaughter is obviously reprehensible, but we can at least understand why a demonic entity would delight in pursuing it. However, the strange esoteric objectives of the next demon on this list are utterly incomprehensible. To the followers of Zinch, sorcery, deception, and knowledge are some of the greatest tools in the galaxy, instruments that can be used to bring about change in all forms, from the subtle and personal to the cataclysmic and galaxy-defining. None better encapsulate the ideals of the Architect of Fate more so than his greater demons, the Lords of Change. Although, despite existing as repositories of forbidden lore and remarkable psychic ability, 
Even they are nothing more than pawns in the infinite labyrinthian plots and schemes of their master. The nature of change is a fickle beast, and thus the lords of change can take on a variety of different forms, though they most often appear as lanky humanoid birds with long necks and extended limbs, with resplendent plumage. They are often draped in clothing reminiscent of what we would associate with wizards, mages, and high priests. And although their powerful limbs, claws, and beaks, as well as the sparkling blades they wield, make them no slouch in melee combat, the real power of the Lord of Change comes in the form of the magics that it is capable of wielding. They are sorcerers without equal, and wield the raw essence of chaos more expertly than even the most skilled assassins can wield a blade or firearm. Their sorcery can come in a lot of different forms, each more terrifying to behold than the last. On one hand, they may send forth billowing plumes of pink and blue warp fire that burn not only flesh, but the souls of their victims as well twisting and contorting them into gibbering creatures of chaos. On the other hand, their magic may be far more subtle, sending out deceptive waves of psychic manipulation that induce feelings of dread, confusion, fear, or any other emotion that the Lord of Change wishes. They are the masters of illusion and can trap the minds of their foes in an infinitely complex network of lies and deceit, rendering their physical form helpless to the encroaching hordes of Zinchian demons. With a few well-placed lies, a Lord of Change can manipulate mortals in its presence to reveal treasured secrets, betray their brothers, ignore ethics and laws, and, whether willingly or unwillingly, commit their life to doing the will of Zinch. They are by far the most intelligent of all of the greater demons, and thus dedicate their immortal lives to collecting information learning everything there is to know within the material and immaterial universe, to the point where they are effectively omniscient. Their intellect is so towering and oppressive that when they gaze upon mortals, they do not see their physical form, but see every moment in their life. Every hope and dream, every failure and success, every fear and ambition that the individual has ever experienced. It would be like if you had the ability to look at another person and then just based on a quick assessment of their personality, physical appearance, and speech pattern, you would know everything about them, every step they have ever taken throughout their life that led them to this moment, every experience they ever had that made them who they are. To make eye contact with such an entity is to witness the entirety of the paradoxical nature and wisdom of Zinch. It is no wonder that few can exist under the gaze of such a creature without immediately having their mind fractured and their sanity eroded. And thus it is that the Lords of Change are so particularly dangerous, not just because of the psychic obliteration that they can unleash upon the battlefield, but in how unbelievably skilled they are when it comes to manipulation. Although to know the true nature of Zinch and his plans is an impossibly ludicrous notion, we can at least witness within his greater demons a desire to redirect the predictable course of history, to, in every possible scenario, direct the future down new and unexpected paths. The Lords of Change seem to have a deep loathing of the trappings of comfort, stability, and familiarity. Instead, whether on an individual scale or scaled up to that of an entire world, a Lord of Change seeks to break apart the foundations of the consistent, to destroy the enduring and eliminate all constants. They seek to obliterate worlds and build them up anew in a twisted mockery of the former. They seem to revel in dashing the hopes of the ambitious while simultaneously raising the dregs of society to positions of ultimate authority. Because of the Lords of Change nature and Zinch in general, it should come as no surprise that them and Nurgle do not get along. And Nurgle and his followers believe in the cyclical nature of the universe, that everything that begins must end, everything that lives must die, and that every creature, big and small, has a predetermined role to play in the inevitability of entropy. Zanch and his lords of change reject that notion, that there is no cycle, that life can go in any direction that it chooses, that there are no constants, and there is only change. I realize that this video has had a pretty serious tone, and now that we've had a bit of time to learn a bit more about all four of the greater demons, I want to take a moment to kind of relax a bit and have a bit more of a casual discussion about one thing in particular that tends to pop up in Warhammer discussions pretty frequently. And that's quite simply, which one of these dudes is the strongest? 
Now, many Warhammer fans claim that it is the Bloodthirster, as the lore specifically tells us that at this moment in time, Korn has seen a resurgence and is considered to be the most powerful god. Which makes sense when you think about it. Korn's power is directly related to how much violence, hatred, wrath, and bloodshed exist in the universe at any given moment. And in the grimdark future where there is only war, violence is not in short supply. However, we also know two important things. One is that all of the gods at one point or another have been considered the strongest as their influence ebbs and flows. And two, time is a meaningless concept to the gods, for they have always existed and never existed simultaneously. Meaning in a bit of a macro perspective, they are always existing simultaneously at their strongest and weakest point. All four of the greater demons are fully capable of doing what their siblings do, just in different ways. Like when it comes to their ability to corrupt, Zinch is often considered to be the master manipulator. But Slanesh is equally skilled in this department, their deception just takes on different forms, it, one a bit more horny than the other. Nurgle spreads his corruption through his diseases, and considering the virulent nature of pathogens, it's a foregone conclusion that such corruption will have no trouble spreading from person to person, or from world to world, or sector to sector. Korn's corruption functions in the exact same manner, it's just not as obvious. Hatred is a disease, it is a sickness of the mind and the soul, and it is profoundly contagious. It spreads on a personal scale from individual to individual, or on a grand scale through radio, vox, pick feeds, or if we want to use a real world example, even our social media feeds. It mimics how a disease becomes a pandemic when it mutates to infect water supplies or become airborne. I mean, honestly, anyone who spent even a minute on the internet over the last five years should be well aware of just how easy it is for rage to transmit across channels. When it comes to physical combat, however, a bloodthirster may be the physically strongest and able to inflict the most damage with a single swing of their blade, but the Great Unclean One can tank more damage than any of the other greater demons, and fights with plagues and diseases in a war of attrition. And meanwhile, the Keeper of Secrets can run circles around all of the other ones, while the Lord of Change fights primarily with magic. And when it comes to magic, if I'm being honest with you, it's as powerful as the author needs it to be for any particular story. I personally think any attempt to rank them is ultimately meaningless, as their positive and negative traits combine together to come to a sum of zero. It may not be the most accurate way of looking at things, but I've always kind of thought of the greater demons in terms of RPG characters. You've got your tank, your fighter, your rogue, and your caster. No one combatant in the arena match is objectively superior. They all have different strengths and weaknesses. One may rise to the top at one point or another, but then those patch notes come in and the meta shifts and everyone respecs or rerolls. By this simple analogy I've laid out, I believe that the true threat is when the need arises for all of these demons to unite together, to set aside their hatred for one another and focus on a singular objective of destruction. Anyone who's ever fought a raid boss before knows you're not going to do it with a doom stack of rogues or fighters. You need a balanced team. I honestly don't think it's a controversial statement to say that Chaos Undivided is substantially more dangerous than any of the gods acting on their own. The four ruinous powers uniting against a common enemy and a full party of greater demons assembling is apocalypse given form. But what do you think of all this? Which one of the greater demons is your favorite and why? Do you disagree with my statement that they are all equal? Or do you think one of the demons and their patron god is distinctively more powerful than the others? Let me know all of your thoughts and questions in the comment section down below. I read just about every single one of them and I try to answer as many of them as I can. I always get the best suggestions from you guys on stuff that I should read into, as although I spend pretty much every day of my life reading Warhammer books, I'm still learning new things each and every day. Anyways, big thanks to everyone who supports the work that I do, and I will catch you all in the next one.